Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cisco Optics Podcast, where we talk about pluggable optics for networks. Coherent optics have been the go-to solution for high-end optical transport systems for years. Eventually, these optics were modularized, and with recent advances in DSP design and optics manufacturing, this technology is now available in small form factor pluggable modules. In March of 2021, Cisco recognized the importance of this technology and acquired the industry's leader by far in this space, Acacia Communications. This is episode 24, and we conclude our conversation with Tom Williams. Tom joined Cisco through the Acacia acquisition in 2021. We talk about the future of coherent optics. Tom leads marketing efforts for the Acacia Coherent Optics team that was acquired by Cisco in March 2021. Tom has spent over 20 years developing optical transmission equipment ranging from 10 gig to 1.2 terabit. He participates in a variety of coherent standardization activities in OIF, IEEE, and Open Rotom, and is co-chair of the OpenZR Plus MSA. Tom spent nearly 15 years in various management roles at Optium, where he participated in the company's 2006 IPO and 2008 acquisition by Finisar. Tom joined Acacia in 2015, where his role has included corporate and product marketing responsibility, as well as contributing to product roadmap definitions. And as I've said before, all roads seem to lead to Cisco. Please follow us on Apple Podcast or subscribe on whatever podcasting platform you use. We're actually part of the Cisco Podcast Network. Check out our blog at blogs.cisco.com and search on hashtag Cisco Optics Blog. All one word, no hyphen, and no spaces. You'll find podcast episode notes with timestamps there. For our YouTube playlist, go to youtube.com and search on Cisco Optics. And for product information, go to cisco.com slash go slash optics. And now join me as I talk with Tom Williams. So, uh, 400 GZR uh, was done by OIF. What's like? What's next? What do you see next? Uh, whether it's OIF or some other standards body. So you know, going through, you know, we we tend to think about it in three main categories uh, in terms of this 400 gig generation. So 400 ZR was done first. Open Rotom defined a carrier-based solution with higher performance and more functionality and, and you know, kind of the OTN framing the carriers needed. And then uh, there's a, a what's called OpenZR Plus MSA that kind of took some of the performance elements of Open Rotom and put it back into an Ethernet optimized solution that plugs into a router um, and you know, sort of took was is the balance between the two things because 400 ZR was very laser focused on a specific use case, but when you look at the broader market, there's a lot of other applications that either want the higher performance or maybe they want the 400 gig operating model, but they want to be able to drop down to 200 gig because so they can address a longer reach and everything. Open ZR Plus addresses all of those kinds of uh, kinds of things. So. Um, those are the three main categories of how we, you know, there, there's lots of other ways that people use, you know, use the solutions that are, you know, closely related to that, but they're the, the main three ways that we think of that generation. Um, and now we're starting to look toward the, the next generation and OIF is working on an 800 ZR. They're also working on an 800 LR that would be a 10 kilometer coherent interface. So that mm. model of coherent continuing to move to shorter, reach interfaces uh, continues. Um, you know, Open Rotom started talking about, you know, next generation and, uh, you know, what comes next. I, I think all of that seems to be, all of the discussion seems to be focused around kind of doubling the baud rate so that we can scale, uh, double the data rate, but maintain the same sort of reaches. So you use the same modulation format when you double the format double the data rate and that allows you to uh, maintain similar types of reaches in uh, in your network so you mentioned the 800 gig activity is including a, a 10 kilometer lr do you see like what do you see in terms of the future of coherent optics in pluggable modules do you see that it's going to be more prevalent in the shorter reaches going forward so 
I do. I, I think the individual steps, I, I, I think it, it's informative to look at what, you know, copper to fiber transitions as a, as a great model where, you know, people, People always project, you know, the end of, of copper, right? And people are really innovative at coming up with new copper solutions <laughs> that That's push true. off the, they're, that. They're end, not just sitting around, copper, you know? right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, so I, while on one hand, yes, I I do absolutely believe Coherent is going to continue to to migrate to short, and ultimately, I think Coherent will be used inside data centers. Um, I I also know that you know direct detect solutions and, and vendors who are working on those those solutions are not going to stand still and they're going to continue to to innovate and and come up with uh with new solutions so our our challenge is always and that's i think for a lot of people in the standardization activity um i think that's part of what they see going on right now is that what we're doing in coherent standardization today is laying the groundwork for where we ultimately need to go. And we're still working through some very challenging uh, questions in, in standardization. I, I would say, um, you know, the coherent standardization has made it so uh, the interfaces can, can talk to each, you know, can, can interoperate. Uh, I don't think it's quite to the point that client optics is where, you know, if you take, vendor a and vendor b it will interoperate over a well-defined link and partly because you know even in something like 400 zr the links are more complicated you've got you've got muxes and demuxes and multiple channels and uh, there's a lot more going on in a link than just having a fiber between the two interfaces and so you know that that makes things a, a bit more complicated but um you know there's there's still conversations that the standards bodies are are working through that I think is is good important work that that needs to be done because ultimately the, these are the things that need to be worked out if coherence is going to move to even shorter reaches I mean I think you mentioned something really important the fact that there are more things going on that these are pretty complicated pretty complicated devices to me it seems like it's a big barrier to entry. Like you need like really smart, capable people uh, designing these, manufacturing them, maintaining them. Is do you do you feel the same way? Because I I I've made statements about just just in client optics getting to hundred gig, we start to see the complexity you know start to ramp up, and in my opinion, that's kind of a barrier to entry where because there are more things that can go wrong. So you just have to have a better organization underneath your, you know, to, to make products, right? You, you have to have a, a more robust organization behind you to, to make sure that everything goes smoothly. Cause there are just so many more things that can go wrong. And if you don't stay on top of them, they, you know, they will go wrong if you don't take care of it. Is that your view of coherent optics as well? Like, do you think that there's a, it's still kind of specialized at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're touching on there, um, and and I think it, you know, a lot of the things we talked about with uh, coherent optics and the complexity of all the different functions and um, you know the signal processing and everything, a lot of that is becoming uh, necessary even in direct detect, right? And and DSPs are widely used in direct detect um they're all parallel interfaces so you've got a lot of different you know components and and picks that have a lot of functionality and everything and so the trade-off becomes a little bit different you know they're almost converging in some respect where you know we're we're getting with the the integration in in coherent we're sort of simplifying how to make a coherent interface um, but also the direct detect is is getting more complex as well. And so, um, you know, I, I do think, I, I think it ties back to the capabilities that I saw when I came to Acacia. Um, you know, that's a big part of what has made Acacia successful, I think, is because there's that infrastructure of all of the the different expertise and, and capabilities and everything. And I... Um, you know, I, I think it it really is key, but I think it's becoming key everywhere, right? I think it it, it 
it really is um, all these devices are getting more and more complex and uh, it, it it really is important that you you have um, a broad range of, of expertise. I, I think it's the right way to, to be structured to do these things well. I, I agree. Sometimes I question myself though, because sometimes I wonder, am I just taking a narrow view? Like, is this, does that, is that expertise required just now because it's still kind of new? Because I, my, my opinion is you still need that, that solid talent base behind you, even in the long term. However, a valid, a valid counterpoint would be, well, you know, once, once it matures, then it starts to become more widely available. And you could look at say 10 gig, like as an example, if, when I've heard, I wasn't in this industry at the time, but when, when we went from SFP one gig to 10 gig SFP plus, I heard a lot of people said, oh my God, this is so hard, right? Factor of 10 in the bandwidth, how in the world are we going to do it? Well, years later, we don't even blink uh, about it now, right? <laughs> Uh, cause whatever hard work was required was done now that it's been manufactured in, you know, gazillions, I don't know the exact number, but we're talking millions, right? All those bugs and kinks have been worked out and now, and now it's, it's relatively accessible technology. So I'm wondering if we just wait long enough and the, if the, the volume ramps up to the same point as 10 gig years from now we would look back at 400 gig or 100 gig we'll say 400 gig in the same light so i don't know what i, do think, I think i think there's there's truth to that um i guess two things that that stand out to me there um one i think it is a new element because so much is being done in cmos today and the investment model for CMOS is so different than, you know, traditional optics at one and 10 gig. Um, you know, it, it, it requires a different kind of expertise. I think it's a little bit of the, the optics world transitioning to look a bit more like the electronics world, you know, which I think we've always sort of thought could happen in the future, but I think we're actually living that and seeing that. Um, and uh, I think, the other thing, I, I was listening to your earlier podcast with uh, with Mark Noel and, and mm -hmm. you know, the points he was making about the, I think there's a difference in the consumption model uh, where you now have big volume being driven early in the life cycle of these newer, higher data rates, mm -hmm. whereas you know, the traditional, if you go back to those earlier data rates, you, you know, even, even at like hundred gig where early hundred gig to volume adoption was, you know, lower volume, you know, telecom users buying CFP hundred gigs and everything. And then it migrated through CFP two before it got to QSFP. Um, and now we see, you know, the first adoption being these, big volume yeah. users. And that's a really different development model. Um, and it, it, it's definitely, you know, I, I think being able to, to support that is, is one of the, the challenges and, and also being able to align. I think the other challenge we all face is getting the requirements across the, the large adopters, the, the large hyperscale customers to align, um, you know, well enough to, you know, part of, partly that, that clarity of, okay, this is the right thing to develop. And, and I know that there'll be a market at the, uh, at the end of it with, with a silicon investment model, right? You need to know that you're developing the right product, right? You, you, you can't invest to develop a, uh, you know, bleeding edge CMOS uh, device, and then find out that it was the and wrong, the wrong time. That's a really expensive mistake. Yeah, expensive both dollars wise and time wise, right? Because <clears throat> yep, yeah. So I think that's a really good point about um, the consumption model being different now. So the 10 gig example that I gave is not actually that equivalent, right? Because with 10 gig, the industry had time 
to kind of mull over and solve these problems when the volume demands weren't huge. And it's only much later that the volume ramped up and then I guess the volume was a little bit more, more aligned with the maturity of the technology. Whereas like you're saying, starting with hundred gig, that volume has to be there from the get go. And yeah. it's only the, the really capable people who can provide that advanced technology and volume at the same time. And then a few years later, it's on to the next generation and we start all over again. The next generation is required in high volume. And again, it's more complex. You got to throw more tools at it from your, from your bag of tools. And so maybe that's, that's the way it's going to go from now on. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see that. I, I think that's the, the shift that, you know, does make it, make it different. I think it's what we all, uh, the challenge we all face today, right. Is, is not just bringing the technology to market, but bringing it to where it's ready to, to scale quickly when, when it, when it hits the market. Well, Tom, it's always fun to try to predict the future, although none of us can actually do it, but it's <laughs> always a fun exercise. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate uh, the conversation. I certainly learned a lot. These are, these are a lot of questions I've had in the back of my mind for a long time, and I really appreciate your explaining these to me. Yeah, thanks, Pat. It, it was a lot of fun. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to join. Thanks again. Thank you. That was the final part of my conversation with Tom Williams. Follow us on Apple Podcasts and leave a review. Or subscribe on whatever podcasting platform you use. You may see the Cisco Podcast Network come up when you search for Cisco Optics Podcast. That's where we live, and you can find other great podcasts there, too. And we'd really appreciate you helping to get the word out. Share this with friends and colleagues that come to mind when you think of network technology and optics. Also, check out the Cisco Optics blogs at blogs.cisco.com and search on hashtag Cisco Optics blog, no spaces and no hyphens. We also have this podcast and educational videos on YouTube. Just go to youtube.com and search on Cisco Optics. Thank you for listening. This is Pat Chow, product manager at Cisco Optics. In the next episode, we'll start a brand new conversation with a new guest. Until next time.